that team had more spirit and played more of a, as a team than any team that I've ever played on in football. We had great coaches, and uh, believe me, uh, it wasn't the pay that got him here, it was the love of football. If you got hurt, you just put rub some mud on it, and that was the end of it, where you didn't play. So to play in the Pine Bowl um, <laughs> when we played, literally, when I say mud, we quickly referred from the stuff being called the Pine Bowl and was now the Mud Bowl. The beginnings of the St. Francis football program, as we know it today, started out in the Inner Fraternity League. We would play each other uh, without pads, but uh, uh, it was supposed to be touch football, but it was, I don't think it was. And uh, we played behind uh, Giles Hall and down in the Pine Bowl. When we started, we had nothing. I mean, borrowed equipment. Uh, Guys are playing the game because they wanted to play football. The, our very first year was our, my sophomore year, which was 1968. We played one game, and we played St. Vincent's. Uh, we didn't have uniforms. We had pads, and they beat the snot out of us. And we thought they were the Pittsburgh Steelers. But we knew we could play. The next step was to find a coach. Art Martinuska was teaching sociology at Mount Aloysius College. Andy Shank's wife, then girlfriend, convinced her professor to give the boys a look. He came out to watch us practice one day. Uh, he just shook his head, um, and it, as only Art could do, and uh, blew a couple whistles at us, and, and I think he told us, enough already, I've seen enough, and we thought that was the end of it. He gathered us all around and said, okay, I, you've, I think you've got something here. I'm not sure it's much, but I'm in. Martinuska had the resources to get more equipment and uniforms, but a small group of students were also instrumental. I was a sophomore and my roommate, Dino Benamati, was a football player. And these guys had everything ready. Uh, and then a week before the first game, my roommate comes in and says, you know, we got players, but we don't have anybody to collect tickets or do any sort of organizational stuff. And I was sitting around. He said, we need your help. And so I got involved, and next thing you know, I was running the program. <laughs> the behind the scene people, the club workers, okay, the, the uh, Dixie Murphys and Marilyn Nace, and all the people that, that ran the club, that, that, that tried to get us the funding from the school, uh, sold hoagies, had raffles, raised money from it for us. I mean, these people are the ones that kept us on the field. But we were sort of the general managers uh, for club football. My successor was a woman. This is 1972. And Marilyn Nace, a woman, was the director of the football club. You know, that's, that's pre-Title IX and all that stuff. You know, that's a big deal. And Marilyn Nace had such a love and dedication for that club football team. I got a call one night at home, and she says, can you meet me on the practice field? at 10 o'clock tonight in full uniform. And I thought, well, maybe she's taking some pictures or something. I don't know what she's doing. So I'm up there in the dark, full uniform, and uh, something come out of the bushes and hit me in the ribs. I thought she broke my, broke my back. Here it was Marilyn Nace dressed in full football outfit, and she said, don't tell anybody. I'm coming to practice tomorrow dressed in full uniform. And she did. She wanted to see what it was like, what the camaraderie was, and how it all happens. And she stood there for a good while before anybody recognized it was her. A lot of, a lot of the guys that played never had played organized football before. And within that, uh, that first year, he shook us all together and we, we took the field. I think we had like uh, eight games or nine games. Um, our f we actually won a game our first year. We beat Niagara University, which was like, uh, that was our Super Bowl. By 1971, the club team had started to make a name for itself. Within a three-year period, uh, we, the, uh, the year af after I graduated, which is probably the reason they did so well, um, uh, we, we, we were a ranked club team. We were ranked number one in the country. I wore this senior. For, uh, first two years, I was number 31. 
Uh, when they moved me to quarterback, I took over number 10, and Jay Roberts took over my old number 31, much to my consternation. Uh, but he's, he's the one that turned number 31 into a real number. It was a great season. Um, we had a lot of players. Um, Alan Andrews was our running back. Chuck Conley was an outstanding running back who they converted to quarterback since there were some running backs that came on board, myself and Alan Andrews. Uh, Joe Perhenik, who was a leader of the team at that time. Uh, Rich Fiore. Um, just a, you know, a lot of great players, a lot of great guys who could have played at other schools but came here for the education. This is, uh, this is a trophy everybody has given after uh, the 71 season. It was the first, our, our first winning season. We're 7-1. and one. We lost to uh, Duquesne in Three River Stadium. It was our first time playing on uh, artificial turf. Uh, everybody had to borrow football shoes. A lot of these guys could have played different level of college football in other schools, but they were here for an education, so they got a chance to play. And I think that's what excelled about it because it was fun. And there was no scholarship, there was no pressure. And when you like to play because you want to play, it makes a big difference, I think, when guys come here to school. Backs get all the credit, but that offensive line, that front seven, was just phenomenal. I mean, they were, it was just, you know, I had Wally Petrosky. Wally was the best center in the world. Guards, Joe Peranek and Rich Fiore. I mean, unbelievable guards. As a matter of fact, the theme song for the, from the movie The Magnificent Seven, that should have been the theme song for the front line. Jay Roberts, now a member of the St. Francis Athletics Hall of Fame, was a two-time All-American in the club era. If, if they were hitting hard, I let Jay have it. If they were easy, I took it. I, you know, I'm a glory hog. I'll admit, you know, I liked it. If, uh, if we were on the one-yard line, if Jay carried it 99 yards, I'd gladly take it over for that one yard. <laughs> Jay was a, an outstanding athlete in high school in a Penn Cambria. And when he came here, he, was, he played football. And I knew he wrestled, so I kind of put him on the eligibility list. And one time, one of my heavyweights uh, got injured, and the other one couldn't wrestle. So I, d I didn't want to forfeit. I hated that. I didn't tell Jay that heavyweight was a position he'd have to fill in for. But I went and got him, and I asked him to wrestle for me that night. And uh, he wrestled heavyweight for me. He was a good athlete, though. And the, the kid outweighed him probably 70 or 80 pounds, but uh, Jay hung in there. and did a good job for me. <laughs> Roberts finished his career with 3,824 rushing yards. In his senior season, he led the National Club Football League in rushing and punting. That led to offers from the World Football League. I couldn't think of a more deserving individual. Uh, I mean, he had the stats, and uh, also, remember, the stats that he ruled up were from an eight-game season. Again, you know, coming from the club football and getting these offers, that's why Chris Valerio is like, that's unheard of. I was in Philadelphia, and you were down at Franklin Field, and it was one-day tryout. And they, they called you in for running backs, and they called you in for, so they had me a running back. And if you didn't run a 4-5 or, or quicker, they cut you on the spot. Because they, and Ron Waller, who was the coach, says, we have to make it big right now. Because this was the second year of the World Football League. So... I got through the spring, the, the morning session, then you had your box lunch sitting in the bleachers, then they brought you back out, and then they made a few more cuts, and they said, we got to make it big, you know, that kind of thing. But I had these other letters from Birmingham. Birmingham, at that time, signed Zonka, Kick, and Morse, who used to play for the Miami Dolphins. So what they did is they were giving these guys million-dollar contracts and then trying to backfill with everybody else. Um, then next thing I got an, an invite to Florida for Jacksonville Express. So I flew to Jacksonville. I was there for about four days, and I was punting and doing some uh, um, cornerback stuff, and they went bankrupt. So then the whole league went under. Mm -hmm. So We beat Duquesne in uh, October of uh, 1976, and I didn't know the history of the rivalry. It, actually, it wasn't much of a rivalry because we hadn't beat them since 1926. It was intense. Right out of the chute, we were down 16 nothing, and with, and they were really running over us. Four minutes to go in the half, our good friend Joe Tomlinson, who passed away a couple years ago, uh, he uh, 
had a pick six and ran it back 65 yards for a touchdown. So then in the ensuing kickoff, uh, a friend of mine, Mike Lozapone, recovered a fumble. And then the next play, we scored on a, uh, on a pass. And uh, we were down 16-14 going into half. We won 26-14. I don't think they got a first down in the second half. I've never seen momentum shift in a game like that, that I was a part of personally. But it was sure fun to play. At the end of almost every practice, we would sprint up out of the pine bowl onto campus, and as we sprint up that hill, everybody would just yell, do game. Yeah. Because yeah. they were our rival. Yeah. Even to this day, they, they are. Yeah. 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 It was a good run. It was. There's some great games. Yeah. Some really great games. Before they had a home field, the Red Flash played many of its home games at Portage Stadium. A beautiful field to play on. The grass was super well taken care of. And I can remember um, my freshman year playing as a defensive back. And all of a sudden, I hear a rumble and couldn't figure out what it was. And then a train whistle blowing. That train whistle blew so loud, and it was within probably 20 feet of the stadium. You couldn't hear the count of the quarterback. Saturday night in Portage became the place to be. It was a social event. And people supported it. The, the fraternities always waited for their parties till after the game. People, we filled the stadium at Portage, which was just an incredible place. We would arrive in a yellow school bus uh, after getting dressed at the Stokes building. And uh, they would bring us down and drop us off. And the bus would return back to campus to pick up the student population, to transport them to the uh, to, to the stadium here. And uh, the bus would then return to students, that yellow bus. And we as football players had to uh, find our way home. So about the third quarter, you're talking to someone along the sidelines and say, hey, can I get a ride home with you? Otherwise, you were sort of stuck in Portage after the game. So that was our, we got a one-way ride, I guess I want to say, to the football game and had the responsibility of finding our own way home. We had some great things. Uh, I'm, Mike Adams, I remember as a lineman, he was either a three or four year All-American. Uh, went both sides of the ball. A lot of, guys, a lot of our linemen went both ways. Uh, of course, Teddy Helso was a running back. Uh, Gary was a thousand yard rusher in high school. And uh, Frank Perenni, great running back. Uh, but a lot of good talent here. Uh, Tell them about the Gallia Dead game at home. Remember, they brought the big drum? Yeah. One favorite memory is a game against Gallia Dead University, the school for the deaf. Yeah, I, I think I still have the scars from that game. That was an exhibition game we played, and it was fun. Well, yeah, and you think about it. So you're you're ready, <laughs> and then you hear this boom. Uh, they would go on a drum beat, so they would have an, an enormous uh, bass drum turned on its side, so the vibrations would come across the field. And when they'd feel the second set or the first set, you know, they'd go off uh, off the ball. Uh, we got to see how they can overcome their handicap and play very well. We did beat them, but uh, they hit very hard. It's lost its luster, but it's, uh, it's hard to believe that, um, yeah, that, was our yeah. protection. that was our protection for our head. And you know, back then, I, I think everybody led with their, was taught to lead with their head to tackle and block and the whole nine yards of football has changed so dramatically over the years but uh, yeah this is uh, thought would keep it just to remember what we forgot <laughs> <laughs> we were playing federal city who was ranked and we were both uh, they were ranked 10th uh, in the country and we upset them here 7-6 and there was a huge fight after the end of the game and I'll never forget being on the bottom of the pile and their team would wear their helmets and give the other guys helmets to swing at us. It was, a, it was crazy. That was one of the craziest moments I ever had in football. I remember how chaotic it was and, you know, Father Jonas yelling, you know, we don't, we're, we're not like this. We're like, we, we are not. In 1978, the Red Flash became a Division III program. None of it would have happened if not for the dedication and leadership of Art Martinuska. Art, Art was just one of those key guys that was just, he, his heart was bigger than him. And uh, he was super to work for. You, he's the kind of coach that he inspired you and wanted you to, to play hard for. I think his, his biggest asset was the ability to 
to place the right people in the right positions. Uh, he's a true leader, uh, and he did an awful lot of work behind the scene. I mean, he wasn't just a football coach. I mean, he acted as, 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 as a football director, too. I don't know how one guy could be the father figure to so many. And this guy cares for you. He's going to be there for you. He's going to make sure he's walking you through financial aid. He's walking you through the, uh, the possibilities of a future for you. He'd get to know your parents. And, you know, I remember him often saying to me, your mother would give her right arm uh, for your success, you know. You know, he was a, he was a great human being. I, I learned so many life lessons from him. He only, he only played one way, so I would stand by him and listen to him coach, because I just liked the comments he made during the game. And he would, always, he would always somehow find a way to get the other team to fumble. He said, we need to fumble, we need to fumble. Next thing you know, I told you they would fumble. And bam, he goes, now he run in with a play. And uh, so, you know, I have some great memories of, uh, of how he coached and, and the love he had for coaching because I know they didn't pay him very much money. He wanted to win football games, but he also wanted men to be successful in life. And I think if you look around the rim at our reunions we have and you see the level of success among the men, uh, I gotta tell you, I think that Art's in their head quite a bit because he was loud, and he was sarcastic, and he was fun. But we had to get our own cleats and stuff at the time. Like, oh. I, you know, when we... It was 20 bucks. You got to camp. It was my fresh year. It was 20 bucks. You got a pair of reconditioned cleats <laughs> if you wanted to use them. Reconditioned cleats. Yeah. Uh, who had ever heard of such a thing? Yeah, and you got a pair of socks, a girdle for your pads, and like two t-shirts. Two yeah. uh, red flash football t-shirts. I was coaching foot, freshman football at Monsignor Bonner in 1990. And I was three years out of football. So where I was coaching... This guy Stump Coin said, listen, we, we think you should be playing football. So he called up the coach Pete Mayock and said, listen, I got a guy who I think could help you guys out tremendously. So Pete said, well, send us some film. And he goes, well, he doesn't have any film. And Pete goes, we told him that. He goes, he played receiver his senior year in, in high school for the last, like, seven games of his senior year. He goes, but I guarantee you if he comes up there, he's going to play. So that's how I found St. Francis. When Kevin McGee arrived in Loretto in the fall of 1991, the program returned to its winning ways. As a freshman, the Red Flash went 6-3. and three. A year later, the quarterback led the school to its first ever postseason appearance in the Eastern Collegiate Athletic Conference. Coach Park was good. Coach Park was a very good defensive coach. Um, good guy. But Coach Pete ran the offense, and you know there were some other good coaches. Coach Palumbo was there, Coach Drycorn. Um, Dan Geegan was on that staff, Matt Mayock was on the staff, just good guys. I think Coach Berg did a great job bringing the team together. Um, even in the off season, you would get, he would get messages to you in the mail, a positive visioning. You know, listen, it's the off season right now, but while you're doing your off season workouts, think about making that game winning touchdown. Think about making that game saving tackle. Our second year we went up to Maris and we beat, uh, we beat Maris in Poughkeepsie. It was like 42-14, but it was like a tied game at halftime. And we kind of came out in the second half, and we laid it on them pretty good. It was one of those, uh, we finally had arrived. McGee puts it the only place that any of us could, you know, I had to go way up high. The kid, well, as I'm in the air, the kid puts his helmet right under my chin. Drives me right, to, somehow I came and landed in bounds. I still don't, because I don't remember what happened. Right. I don't remember hitting the ground. I, I just remember holding on to the ball, and the next thing I know is he's throwing the, the defender off me and picking me up. How did you hold on to that ball? <laughs> I, I still don't know how I made it to the sideline. I really don't. You know, looking back on playing with Kevin, um, there was rarely a ball that you had to die for or jump. I mean, you were great hit mid-stride. I mean, I, it was a fun offense. Um, you know, when we started to open it up with some three and four wide receiver sets, as a receiver, I mean, it couldn't have been a more fun time. Even if you were a decoy route, you still had an opportunity to get the ball. Um, uh, there were multiple games where either myself or Todd Eckenrode, or one of the other receivers, would have um, games where we caught, you know, in the teens, number of catches. They always caught the ball no matter where it was. Uh, they had great hands. Uh, Danny had a little more speed than Elliot. Not, you know, we did both know that. Yeah. But Danny could definitely <laughs> stretch the field, and Elliot was very reliable. I mean, uh, yeah. guys like Todd Eckenrode as yep. well. Um, great hands. Randy Bills was a tight end, but yep. these, these guys both uh, had great hands. That didn't matter. They were going to go get it. So. 
October of 1993, we played Central Connecticut State for the first time. Um, they were coming off of a Division II full scholarship to jump into the NEC, which is uh, we, we were moving up from Division Three. We were non-scholarship, but we were one double A, and uh, they came into our house looking uh, gigantic compared to us. And um, it was a special day because of the circumstances surrounding it. One of our captains, uh, Kurt Martin, uh, his brother Frank, um, had you know battled cancer for years. Um, in fact, when you walked in the locker room as a freshman. You know, I vividly remember seeing the picture of um, Kurt's brother Frank sitting, you know, in a photo sitting next to Bo Jackson. And I'm thinking, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Then to find out that that was part of a, a Make-A-Wish um, opportunity that he had to go meet, you know, his favorite athlete. So that game was special because we won on a field goal. And it started pouring when we were driving down to kick the field goal. And I know when we kicked the field, field goal, the crossbar was like soaking wet. So when the ball hit the crossbar, it kind of like skipped in and we won. Where uh, if that crossbar was dry, the ball probably bounces back and we lose. But Kurt's brother Frank had had a horrible week of, um, of treatment and was not doing well. And his brother, Kurt's brother Frank, lived for coming to watch his big brother play. So Kurt was a quiet leader, didn't say a whole lot, but was down in the dumps all week. But his brother somehow rallied for game day uh, and made it there. So at the end of the game, it, it was um, uh, Coach Perg always gave a game ball to the, the top player of the game. And I think Kevin had completed 33 or 36 passes. And when Coach Perg handed Kevin the game ball, he and Kurt Martin went and grabbed Kurt's brother Frank out of the stands, brought him over, gave him the game ball. And it was uh, you know, probably the, the best moment in uh, – in my career. Well, you know, I always had it in my mind that I was going to play football from the time I was five years old. Um, but I thought it was going to be in a blue and a white uniform, not in a red, uh, a red and white uniform. You know, I thought I was going to go to Penn State and play football. But St. Francis came calling. In 1996, St. Francis rose to the ranks of Division I football and became a charter member of the Northeast Conference. During his career in Loretto, linebacker Matt Fairball earned all-conference honors. The game that we lost to Robert Morris um, in my sophomore year, Robert Morris was, you know, going to win the conference championship, and we were we were two and seven at the time, I believe, um, playing competitive in some games. But you know, Robert Morris was to, to come in here and beat us. But um, you know, we controlled the game for three and a half quarters. In the mud, another mud game. Every game in the Pine Bowl was mud, it seemed like, in the second half of the season. And um, we, uh, you know, we felt so good going into that fourth quarter. And then, you know, what you want to call it, the curse of the Pine Bowl or whatever happened. But, you know, a fumble on a play, uh, a blocked punt. Next thing you know, we find ourselves down 16 to 15 uh, with five, four minutes to go in the game, but still life. Our offense tra drives the ball down into field goal range. We think we're going to win the game on the last second field goal, and the field goal's blocked, you know. But that game kind of gave us, I feel like, you know, that we knew we could compete. We could compete with anyone. I mean, that, that Robert Morris went on to win the conference championship, and um, I just think that it, it, you know, even losing that game, it just kind of felt like, you know, we were as good as anybody else in the conference that day. You know, uh, there's been a number of NFL players, a number of players that I played against that were drafted and went on to the NFL. Um, you know, Tim Hall from Robert Morris in my freshman year. He was a running back. Um, he was drafted, went to the NFL, and uh, played a few seasons. We had uh, a number of players that I think could have played very easily at, at some of the um, Division One colleges, but. You know, they just never had the exposure to get there. Look at this. This is actually when we thought we this is when we started. First time you actually believe St. Francis had a chance to win the NEC. To be honest, I never heard of St. Francis until Darnell Richardson, you know, came and talked to me a little bit about it. But the, the campus was beautiful. And uh, the one question I did ask Darnell is, where's the football field? And he kind of pointed and said, you see those pine trees? He goes, it's on the other side of there. And I, after that, he showed it. And I was like, wow, you're, you're not messing around. That was one of the reasons I wanted to go there. I wanted to build a program. The coaches told me I had an opportunity to play early as a freshman. And 
that's something I wanted to do. I didn't want to go kind of red shirt somewhere, or sit around. I wanted the opportunity to play early and to build something. A bunch of us started as freshmen, so you know we had nothing to lose. We just wanted to put together a camaraderie and get after it. And I think uh, going into our junior and senior year, our offense was ranked fourth in the country. Catching passes from quarterback Anthony Doria, Caputo and the Red Flash offense lit up the scoreboard. My favorite game, even though it was a loss, was our junior year up at Sacred Heart in Connecticut. Um, our offense was clicking on all cylinders. I mean, we really couldn't be stopped. The only problem was we couldn't stop their running back who actually ran for over 300 yards that day. We ended up losing 53-49, but that day I had 14 catches for 294 yards, which 294 yards is still a record in the conference for a single game, I believe. The things and records that we set individually and as a team on offense was awesome. And I think, you know, that transition from that period to when we, you know, Coach V came in, you know, and now they're, you know, conference champions. I think they did a lot of good things there. Former NFL All-Pro Chris Valerio was named the 25th coach in St. Francis history in 2009. Valerio brought a new attitude to Loretto. But when Coach Valerio came aboard with Chris's uh, experience with what Chris brings to the table with his 12 years in the NFL uh, in the way he handles and treats these young men has been something that he's evolved that I'm not surprised. One story um, that I got with playing with Coach V, it was my freshman year, he walked up to me and was showing me a drill. So mind you, it was pretty much like probably, probably about four years out of the NFL at that time. And he put his hands on me to show me the drill. And I looked at our defensive coordinator, it was like, can you please tell him never do that again? <laughs> I feel like he knocked my shoulder out of socket. <laughs> Current defensive coordinator Bishop Neal was recruited to St. Francis in 2011. A.J. Anderson was the guy that actually recruited me to, out of Clarion. Um, he he uh, gave me a few calls, him and uh, I think, believe it was Coach Nolf at the time I was here. Um, they brought me up to campus, got me to campus, uh, get, met Coach V. As soon as I met Coach V, I pretty much knew this was the spot for me. He brought that NFL mindset, and um, he, a lot of the other coaches that I was talking to at the time, it, it just seemed like they didn't, they didn't really play the game. Neil also played alongside Lorenzo Jerome. In 2017, Jerome became the first St. Francis Red Flash player to appear in an NFL regular season game since Joe Restick played for the Philadelphia Eagles in 1952. NFL scouts are now keeping an eye on the St. Francis program. When guys make it, uh, they get a shot at the NFL, it definitely help, um, it definitely help with recruiting, it also helps with the, the team. Just, it, it shows that it's, uh, it's, that it's possible. Coming from such a small school, it shows that it's possible and it's, it's great. Those guys, the biggest thing about those guys, it wasn't just their football aspect, it's more their, their, uh, just them as a person. And uh, I think they, they deserved everything they got, and I'm trying to instill that into the guys that we have now. In 2016, the Red Flash captured its first ever Northeast Conference title. It's a long way from the start of club football 50 years ago. We're proud to be part of a program that's won the conference and has a chance to play in the playoffs every single year. I just think the tradition, and I think Coach V has, has done tremendous about that. He, he has really embraced the history. Uh, he's reached out to the, to the guys from the older years. And I think he's kind of got the same uh, outlook on things as Coach Mark Nuska did. He, he's uh, with the Mark Nuska Scholarship. I've got to be around uh, the players a fair amount. Uh, very respectful, uh, very nice young men. And I, I think that reflects on Coach and his, his staff. I mean, compared to what we had, and you look at what they've got now and the facilities, I mean, it, 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 show, it shows you. Fo football means something to the school. I mean, it really does. And I'm glad, you know, that we had a chance to start it.